delighted to be from the crew. Um, especially it's nice to meet to some people that I've recognised met before, but uh, one that probably gets honourable mention is, is Danny Grace, who is my history teacher. Um, kind of incited the, the love of history and we did the least be an archaeologist, although he taught me the five hour public and the Nazis. So I'm a good, a good deal away from that at the moment. Um, so um, as Mary said, what I suppose which she, she asked me to speak, what I said I'd, I'd kind of think about looking into was um, I suppose the nature of kingship in Alien the Environment, but specifically which is reference to, to Tipperary. And um, Cashel is a site that I did part of my PhD. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. The mic is is it, is it on? Okay. Um, I'll try to speak a bit more here, but that's all. Um, so I did I did part of my PhD research on um, the rock of Cashel. Is that right? Fundamental to understanding 
Irish society, but it also, it's also why we can look at somewhere like Tipperary, which is a relatively small part of Ireland, and identify quite a lot of, of royal places and quite a lot of kings and, and identities that we have to think about in, in, in royal terms. So before we start to start to do it, um, there'll be a lot of people names, a lot of kind of nomenclature, set of nomenclature. Um, if you speak Irish, if you understand Irish, it's probably not, not this, is, this is nothing new, but if you were like me and you've forgotten your Irish since you did um, the Leaving Circle or whatever, and um, this kind of graph is essentially um, quite important because what it tells us is the way that collective names to refer to kingdoms and peoples developed through the, through the period. So we start off with kind of archaic formulas, <coughs> words ending in Riga, um, or in Om terms, we get it in Om terms, which is Mokko. And then by the 11th and 12th centuries, we've gone from E, which refers to grandparents, to, to Ua, um, which is kind of the origins of you know, the, the O, like O'Sullivan or O'Donnell or whatever you get in, in modern surgeons. But why this is important is because these collective names have a chronological importance. So there, there's a relative chronology between these names that allows us to see when those names and those identities emerged. And there's a correlate to that when those, those kingdoms that these, these names refer to emerged also. The other thing that I want to do is, and this is, I suppose, a bit of a caveat in that, and one of the things that I like to do in my research is try and, try and challenge perceived norms. And, and in, in, certainly in Tipperary terms, there's very little you can say historically about early medieval Tipperary because we have very different sources. Um, but the received wisdom or the received history of Tipperary in any book that you'd open about the medieval period in Tipperary, we have a very general history that I believe is entirely inaccurate. <laughs> because it's based on later, very propagandistic sources. Um, so what I try to do is, is try and build history back up from the bottom in material terms using archaeology and how bits of evidence we can reconstruct from bits like genealogies and, and animals. Um, probably the most important family or dynasty in that sense is, is the Ogana. They would be the, the dynasty most intimately connected with Cashel and I suppose associated with domination of, of Munster in the medieval period. Um, Traditionally speaking, this is seen to be a dynasty that emerged in the 5th century when Conal Kirk and their, their ancestor um, was born and when he came back from exile in Scotland, he supposedly founded the, the Rock of Cashel. Then once he founded Cashel, he established his sons in kingdoms throughout Munster um, and these became the ascendant following in their respective regions and then that's what created Munster. And none of it is true. Um, there's no, no evidence that Conal Kirk was actually to be connected with Cashel or even that he actually existed. Um, and the, the idea that these dynasties that we refer to the, the, the organ, all these different these lineages that we have on, on screen, are actually biologically related is, 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 is definitely flawed, it's definitely inaccurate. Um, why that's important is because if we do away with that, that myth about the organ and the existence of monster from Conal Kirk's time, actually what we, we get is is um, a number of different kingdoms, a number of different regional kingdoms in which Tipperary is the kind of the centerpiece and the battleground for supremacy and, and control of the wider, the wider kind of polity of Southern Ireland and, and Munster. So I would suggest that actually what we have is in the start of the year in the EU period, two and confederations of people that aren't actually related to each other and um, come together for political reasons to, to control territories and to create kingdoms. So we have what Historians call an East Munster Organ and a West Munster Organ, but they're not, they're not actually, actually related. Um, and within each of those confederates, uh, confederacies are, are different lineages um, that control discrete little, little kingdoms, many of which are actually in, in Tipperary. The most important is probably this dynasty called the Emach Lara, who are the, 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 the principal family connected with, with Cashel, and for the most part seem to have controlled the majority of central and southern. Southern Tipperary for the, the medieval period or the early medieval period. Um, some of the branches of that dynasty are even connected with, with royal sites like this, this town that we're, we're in today, Turles. Um, so, who is it? I'll find on the, the map which, which family are So, a, des a descendant of um, Angus, one of the descendants of Angus, um, gave rise to a family which are called the Ogunach, or the Ogunach of, the Ogunach of, of Eastern Pew, which is the district between kind of Nakhane and Limerick and, and, and Turles here today. But their capital was, was Darlus Oak Fort, which is the origins of the, the name Turles itself. So we don't know where that Oak Fort was, um, but that's one of the kind of, that's one example of a, a lost royal site in Tipperary that we have yet to, to 
fight. <coughs> What's distinctive about these families is that they all have connections to a specific royal seat that they take as their, their center, of, center of power. And so the Ogan of Rackland, who were the Eachach, connected with Garolds in, in County Cork, and Ogan of Loch Lane, with Loch Lean or Loch Larney. And, but the families amongst the Eamach Lara seem to have controlled sort of Western Tipperary and South, Southern Tipperary and been connected with sites like Care and Cullen and Knockaini and places like Brewis and Cashel itself and, and even a whole host of other small sites in kind of the, the southwestern corner of Tipperary on Care and, 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 and Schlieve Muck. Um, but all of those sites have, have never really featured in the story of how, how Cashel came to be so, so prominent and, and, and important. Just as a sort of a, a way into that, um, to illustrate what I mean, um, we often think in terms of, in terms of the environment as these, these, these polities and these kingdoms being relatively static and not moving around so too much, but actually they could, they could move quite large distances and the shape of their kingdoms could change quite, quite dramatically. Um, an example is the area of um, North Tipperary and Southern Offaly. Um, these, are, these are people who are essentially lived in the land at so the end of the early medieval period to the north of Cashel, stretching as far as, um, as, far as um, southern, su southern tip of, of Offaly. And famous is the Eli O'Carroll as the Eli O'Carroll and in kind of north tip of and Offaly. Um, but one of their principal royal seats towards the end of the medieval period is probably this site, Motor um, in uh, just on the Offaly Tipperary border, just outside Money Gaul. Um, and in a road scheme that went through uh, Money Hall in the construction of the M7, and there was a huge cemetery um, found near the Moat Quarter, which um, seems to be a, a royal cemetery, a place of assembly for that, for that local kingdom of the, the area. And so this, this mound you see at the top left hand side of the screen is probably the inauguration place for the Kapoor, the kings of the kings of Ada in that, in that period. Um, but previous to this, um, place name evidence suggests that the area had actually and for the most part, it <coughs> belonged much farther north. So this is Crotton Hill in um, County Offaly, which is crew upon Grey and the, uh, the, 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 the hill of the, of the gap of the area, which suggests that this, this tide who lived further south um, actually originated from further north and migrated south. Um, Devil's Fish Mountain um, is bare known area, and um, again, the, the, the name of this people, that's the very medieval name of it, um, which again suggests a kind of Contraction of this people towards the end of the late medieval period. Um, just as an interesting aside, this is um, a gold cup, probably a kind of a Bronze Age gold that was found at the base of um, Devil's Bit Mountain. Um, but it, it was actually it was found by, in the 17th century by um, the Christopher family, but it, uh, it was used as a template for a crown that was given to, to Daniel O'Connell um, in the 18th, 18th century, 19th century, um, when he was kind of crowned as a folk king, folk king of Ireland. Um, but it does show kind of a longer term ritual significance in these, these places <coughs> with the area. And I suppose so too to, to Cashel as the kind of the, the major royal site of, of Munster. Um, so I suppose Cashel is famous as you know, the, the seat of kingship in Munster, the kind of um, the principal centre of, of power in Munster in, in, in one sense. But at what point Cashel becomes um, the seat of Munster, um, and whether or not it is kind of predetermined to be the seat of, of, of a kingdom of Munster is, is really up for, for debate. And um, this is really the, the picture that we all get to Cashel when we think of you know, the cathedral, the round tower, and um, the, the tower house, and Corpus Chapel on the, the top of the rock. But it's a much more complex site than that. And people like Brian to work on Rapid Rhythm have really shown how extensive and um, important that landscape is in, in more recent times. Um, I would sort of argue that the Cashel was essentially a military site, and I'll show you why in a few minutes, um, in terms of it being established as a, as a kind of a border stronghold by people called, I call the Ema Glera earlier on, who used Cashel as a base for subjecting the polities to the, to the east and south, and um, in Kilkenny, North <coughs> Cork, and, and South Tipperary. Um, and then from that base of Cashel, they ended up extending their authority throughout Munster in the late 17th century and creating what we know as the Kingdom of Munster, but I don't think there's any evidence for, for Cashel being, being in, a, in, a, in, a, in essence, a provincial seat much before that, that period. And so you can kind of see the, how that, that model plays out in terms of the principal territorial division of major kingdoms in Munster through that, that period. <coughs> and 
What we know about royal sites in later prehistoric and, and early medieval Ireland is that generally some of the principal royal sites tend to focus around a particular type of, of prehistoric um, acropolis, prehistoric ceremonial monuments that were used by medieval kings as, as the backdrop for centers of center of authority. What's distinctive about Cashel is that it lacks all of these types of monuments that characterize places like Tara, Cotton, Nakolin, or, or Nathan Fort. And, but just to the south of Cashel, and a, a place called Ketra Fort, and we actually have a landscape that's very similar to the places like Tara, places like right, Nathan Fort, which is never, never referred to in the literature as a royal site, but it was, in essence, probably a very significant royal site. And, in the myth which connects Conan Kirk with the foundation of Cashel, it actually says that he was at Nathrapa and Cair before he went to Cashel, but he's already a king of Munster before he goes and founds Cashel, so it implies that he could be a king of Munster without being a king of Cashel. But this is a really interesting landscape. So Petra Fort is the site you see on the top left, which is an internally ditched enclosure. It's, it's a hen, it's a late prehistoric ceremonial monument on a hilltop just outside Cair town. Um, it seems to have a northeastern entrance, so that might be a not knocked into the fort later. And, and immediately outside of this is what I think is a mound, a sort of a ceremonial monument. Um, but probably the most interesting thing is um, Keelong Town Land, which you can see at the bottom of the image, is this um, <coughs> pattern of linear fields, which is very unusual to, to get. It stretches for about four kilometers, and from the, exactly from the base of Ketra Fort, right to the, to the Barony boundary, to the boundary of this, this park. And I would probably suggest that this is a ceremonial routeway for, for kings to enter this landscape and to see to the crest of Kedra Fort itself. And so this is another example of, you know, in essence, a lost royal site, a lost important royal seat that would repay further study to pay some, 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 some proper archaeological survey work. But it would, for my money, be, have potentially be a very significant royal seat and, and one of, of quite, a, quite, quite some importance. That's implied too by some of the material culture that has been found in the vicinity of the fort. And so Ewer, which is a form of high status pottery, and projecting ring-headed pins, which is a very, very rare type of, of dress ornament in the 5th and 6th centuries, and have actually been found in this fort, showing early medieval activity, but early medieval high status activity, commensurate with what been identified as, as a royal site. Um, <coughs> why Cashel itself is distinctive in that regard is while other royal sites of this period in Ireland have that kind of prehistoric element and ceremonial element from later prehistory. Cashel, Cashel doesn't. Um, it doesn't have any of the same density of prehistoric monuments that would characterize other, other sites. And um, what it seems to be is what I was going to suggest is, is a fort. And um, part of the reason for suggesting it's a fort is to do with the, the, the morphology of it. And I'll show you why. But um, it's a key point to note that the, the, the natural topography of the rock is actually formed through a box fold where you get the junction of two geological zones. And what happens is the, the sheets of limestone that have been originally bedded flat and come, become pushed up and you get this new profile in the in the, the rock itself. And the earliest evidence we have for lands associated with kings and cattle and actually doesn't seem to be around cattle itself, it seems to be around not Grafton, Kedra, Cashel, or Kedra, and that site of Kedra that I was referring to previously. And some work I've been doing with Tomasa Caragon in, in UCC and suggests that the area around Turin and Pecon, um, in southwestern Italy, um, was actually a royal state of Kings and Cashel from at least the 6th or 7th century. Um, probably for, in, 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 in certain respects because it was a place that was patronized by kings. And um, Turin Pecon is significant because it's um, one of the earliest texts we have from early medieval Ireland. It's a, a letter to, um, a letter written to, to Bacon the Hermit, or mentioned to Bacon the Hermit, it seems to be the origins of the name Turin Pecon itself. Um, between Turin Pecon and St. Arthur's Kyle, this is the only place that we get early medieval cross slabs, kind of commemorative cross markers for, for people who died, high slabs of people who, who died. Um, but it seems to be quite a significant little, little estate um, with a number of different, interesting different, different elements. Um, so I mentioned Ema Clare previously, and this, this territory that's shown in this map seems to be the heart of their, their lands. Um, so Bruis there, where you have um, a couple of sites large forts within this, this, this estate of Bruce. That seems to be um, a royal site of the, the Arid, and um, kind of name <coughs> the same, same, same origins of the, the term. And um, but they owned territories in this area here and Bruce was one of their, their significant seats. And um, Donald Hill is another another probably royal site of another family and um, perhaps the, the 
Cuna for, for her norms, and, and Cullen would be another one, that's just that's a picture there, that we connected with another part of that dynasty. And what's significant about that state around St. Barbara's Kyle is we seem to have a very early um, royal, royal landscape, and you can see this in some burials at the, that mark the northern boundary of the, the, the present parish um, that are 6th or 7th century in, in date. And, and the area on the left hand side of the screen, which has a little blue dashed area, just seems to be an assembly place. So, where a local kingdom would come on a regular basis to assemble, and where the town and the drum, drum and bay seems to mark a, a place where people gather together. So, drum is the same origin as the, the modern English word throng to signify a crowd of people. So, it's a toponym that signifies an, an assembly place. Um, and right in the, the, the neck of that, of that, that town, and right on the river, is a huge mound. And it seems to be the, the ceremony and assembly place of, of that kingdom. Um, so that's one piece of evidence for a very significant royal siege here. Um, Turi Pekon is a part of that we don't have otherwise. But also, we had the parish of Turi, or the parish of Kilardry, which might be in um, Church of the High King, um, which again provides royal significance as a tax portion, which you can see um, through the thing just, um, just over to the left hand side of the the image on the, the right. Um, but the place names around that suggest a, a royal hunting lodge. Um, Clay Hill and North Grill suggest a forest, um, a forested area that's the domain of the, the kings, um, and also has some evidence for, for early medieval burials. So it might suggest a kind of a hunting lodge, an aristocratic activity associated. Um, it's high status people, but a really, a really significant royal activity at some period. So again, another evidence for um, an, an aspect of, of a royal landscape has been, been otherwise lost. And um, Colin itself is a really interesting one. Um, I mentioned that it seems to be connected with the, the Cunach um, family who rose to prominence probably in the 18th and 19th centuries and um, probably actually adopted that, that seat from the Eman Clara when they, when they moved to Cashel and adopted Cashel as their principal royal seat. And um, Colin itself is really interesting because it does have some of these prehistoric elements that we get at major royal sites. So it is a henge monument, it surrounds a couple of arrows given a prehistoric burial element, um, and there is this hint in excavation that were conducted in the 60s of some early medieval burials suggesting continued activity, but it's documented as, a, as, a, as a, an early medieval royal site in any case. Um, the site here you can see on the screen overlooks the, the Bog of Cullen, but the Bog of Cullen seems to have been very significant as a place of votive deposition from prehistory right through to the, the early medieval period. Um, so there is Bronze Age evidence for votive deposition in this, this bog in the form of almost a strange artifacts found in the 16th and 17th century, including ones that, that look or sound very similar to that, that item that was found at the base of Devil's Good Mountain, which is the image of there. Um, but one of the more significant things we realised recently was this, this Roman figurine that was found from, from the bog itself. So this is Iron Age evidence of Roman objects being deposited in the Gothic manner in the, the bog. Um, later in the early medieval period, people returned to it and they used it to deposit Viking Age or Viking objects objects got through contact with the Vikings, probably in Limerick, and in the bog, the bog itself. Again, you know, suggesting high status activity <coughs> and, and ritual activity in the vicinity of this, this otherwise, you know, very obscure, very unknown royal landscape. And so there are a couple of examples of, you know, royal seats that we can identify through combining archaeology and historical references. And, but we can get an idea of what sort of role these sites started to fill in society in temporary. If we look at Cashel itself, and start to deconstruct and pick apart what Cashel is. Um, so this is what's called a photogrammetry model of, um, of Cashel, where we use a drone to take overlapping photographs and it maps up features that, um, that are otherwise kind of, um, you can't really see to the naked eye. Um, but hopefully you can make out just in the centre of the picture, um, immediately to the west of the, the, the modern summit, there's a whole host of evidence for earthworks, little linear features and curved banks um, that seem to be archaeological in character, but they've been very heavily disturbed through quarrying activity and even more recently through a lot of metal detecting, which is illegal, that seems to have been done on, on the rock. Um, so that's one of the first indications that we have a quite significant complex on the rock and wider complex than we're, we're used to thinking of previously. So here's some evidence for what I think is actually Fort, fort, a fortress on the Rock of Cashel of, of early medieval date. So you can see there's a wide ditch on the top left, 
and there was a rubble wall that stretches for 40 meters just along the top of the crest of a break in slope or um, the crest of a rock face. So, so this rubble wall here um, is just along here. It's this stretch of a rock, um, natural rock face there. Um, so it seems to have been to create a kind of um, a defensive, you know, enhance the defensive character of the, the rock. Um, in other places, um, that defensive character, the natural terraces of the rock, have been augmented through um, large orthostatic blocks of limestone that have been placed on the edge of the, of the on the edge of the, um, the rock face, and um, to again enhance the height and enhance the defensibility of the, the rock face. And you can see a couple of examples of the collapse there in the image in the centre of the, the screen. Um, this is another example here where it seems that um, the natural rock face has been cut down on either side. And, the build-up of soil on the inside face of the rock has actually fractured the stones outward. So this would suggest on the north face quite a significant complex of, um, of defensive features. Um, we also might have a bit of evidence for an original entranceway to the rock, um, and I'll show you another one in some geophysics. Um, but you can see here a huge rock cut gorge into the northeast corner of the rock, um, that would suggest a kind of steep, um, intentionally steep entrance to the summit of the rocks was debilitated because it would, if you had to climb up it, um, you couldn't do it on horse, you had to, to walk up it, and there's just some evidence for steps in part of this as well. Um, but hopefully you can just make out from the bottom left-hand corner of that image, the top right, um, there's a whole series of banks and, and earthworks on the northeastern corner of the rock as well, which are archaeological and again seem to link up with those features on the, the northern face, um, which seems to be evidence for, for fortification. Hopefully you can see in the bottom left hand image, which is a LiDAR model, so a laser scan of the, the landscape, you can start to see some evidence for enclosures. Um, so this is the area as in the photogrammetry. So we have evidence perhaps for um, a linear earthwork here. Um, this is definitely an enclosure here. Um, this might be a barrow or a burial monument um, here in the centre. So quite a lot going on that was otherwise <coughs> uh, previously unknown at Cashel itself. Um, so this is a kind of a schematic of what you can identify through um, looking on the ground, looking at the photogrammetry and, and the light are features that you can map out that are certainly archaeological. Um, that kind of led me to, to look at more kind of innovative ways of, of looking at passion. So um, over the last couple of years with colleagues in, in Earth Sound, Geophysical Survey Services, um, we did quite a large scale survey of the, the rock caches and landscape. So about 28 hectares of geophysical survey was done. This is where we measure the, the magnetic and electrical properties of the soil to map below ground buried archaeology that mightn't have any above ground um, traces. <coughs> Hopefully you can make out some of the features, particularly around the four Abbey there to the, to the left, there's quite significant features and you can see that enclosure just above area four there that um, I was showing in the diagram. In area five here, we might have an actual entrance to the rock at some stage, where we have evidence for two banks that seem to approach the, the modern entrance and create an avenue up to that, to that modern entrance that might be, be medieval. We also have evidence which is quite significant for, for outer enclosures. So you can see just here and here, and this seems to be evidence for, for large outer enclosures around the, the rock of Cache that were, that were previously unknown. So this is the kind of cumulative interpretation of the, the archaeology that was, that was found. Um, but what it suggests is not just the existence of a series of outer enclosures around the rock, making the archaeological complex a lot bigger than, than we knew previously. Um, it also suggests a whole series of distinct enclosures on the rock, like that one um, here. This one here, another one here. Um, and in, in conjunction with those enclosures, what we seem to have is actually the remains of the fortress that gives its name to Cashel itself. So Cashel comes from a derivative, an old Irish derivative of the Latin castellum, which is you know, a Latin Roman word essentially for a fortress or a fortified place. So this seems, this, this archaeological complex seems to be the origins of, of that name. Um, other significant things that we found is possibly in the top um, right hand corner, northern corner of the, the interior <coughs> near the Round Tower. <coughs> circular setting of stones with a centre of rectangular feature that might be a burial place that might be um, mentioned in 7th or 8th century texts as the, the burial place of Amos and Mount Fife, which is probably the earliest thing we can associate with Cashman in a historical sense. So that would be how I would reconstruct um, all these features. I mean,
terms of a whole series of different enclosures defining precincts and, and, and kind of areas within the rock, and, but also a whole series of enclosures that define hierarchy of space and going into categories. So none of this was, was known previously until we did these, these surveys and started to look in a little bit more detail. And hopefully the, the canny amongst you, that was my Newcastle majority accent coming out when I was in the word canny. Um, but you can probably see that Main Street in Cashel has a nice acting profile that corresponds to the, the profile of that, that interior acting enclosure, which you can see hypothesized on the, the image. Um, these are the sorts of fortresses that I think Cashel is best parallel with. Um, what's interesting is that they're, they're best parallel in Northern Britain and Western Britain, where we have sites that um, are evidently fortresses and places that were fortified, places like Dunad um, or Clashel Crag. Dunamis in County Leash might be another parallel for one of these major sites of fortresses that seem to be very significant in the early medieval period. Why that's significant at Cashel is that um, it, that evidence for a fortress really explains its, um, its difference from other royal sites like Tarn in an Irish context. Um, so this is a map showing the royal estate associated with Cashel itself. Um, and it's quite an extensive royal estate. Um, but what's interesting about it is that it's not actually one that kind of lends itself very easily to the landscape. It's not a natural topographical unit, a natural landscape unit, which suggests that it has kind of complex, complex origins. And many of you might be familiar with Kirk Kirkuvatrock and the, the plain of Cashels um, called Kirkuvatrock. Um, and that actually doesn't refer to a plain, it refers to people, um, subject people who would have been based in that territory, in that royal estate, um, and whose royal seat has never actually been, been identified. But it's somewhere within that, that area outlined in, in blue. Other evidence that Ashley's genesis is, is <coughs> defensive, military in nature, and that that fort on the road itself suggests is a whole series of forts to the south of Cashel itself. Um, so there's a whole series of, of large multi valleys so multiple enclosure forts positioned on hilltops and, and high ground facing south and east to the, to the, to the south of the rock of Cashel itself. So places like Richard has been good working on at Rack places like Valerie, and, and, and places like Windmill Hill all suggest actually a defensive core of monuments, probably in the 5th and 6th centuries, delimiting the area around Cashel as a, a major royal seat, but a, a major defended outpost and a, a defensive place. Um, and you can see why that's important, hopefully, when you look at the map and see Kedra and Ilian, which is another known royal seat to the south of Cashel. These seem to be, the, the Kedra is the port that I showed you, the kind of <coughs> that, that long linear procession of linear fields, and um, that suggests a kind of procession of route with to, to Kedra. So that would suggest another important royal site in the south of Cashel, which would explain why it's been defended from the, from the south. When we look at churches, um, another way of looking at that defensive aspect is thinking about the fact that we have very little evidence for churches in the landscape around Cashel. Cashel is famous for being supposedly the most quintessentially Christian kingship known from, from Ireland, because it's king for ecclesiastics and Whatever. But there's, there's no certain church within the royal domain itself that is definitely early medieval in, in date. The majority of churches that we know to be documented and, and, and known from the early medieval period actually occur outside the royal domain. Um, so that absence of churches, um, early medieval churches in the landscape, might suggest um, another aspect to this militarised, defensive nature to actually its, its earliest importance. So that would be the 5th and 6th centuries in terms of the origins of Cashel. In the 7th century, when we get a settlement pattern development, we see something very different. We start to see the demarcation of this estate, the royal domain of Cashel, through the position of barrows and, 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 uh, and other types of monuments. But we also see the, the, the creation of a, a cluster of different <coughs> types of settlements. And so it doesn't really make sense when you have a nice colored map like this. When you spend three or four years thinking about it, it starts to make sense. So what I would suggest we have in the royal domain is, is a whole settlement hierarchy where these forts that are large, centrally placed forts become centres of clusters of other ring forts or kind of early medieval farmsteads to cluster around. And that these were the seats of the members of the royal household who maintained the king in the royal court um, when they were in, in residence on the, the rock itself. Um, so that would be one element of how Cashel emerged and developed as a, as a royal site. And then when it became a royal site in the 7th and 8th centuries, it becomes a really important ceremonial place because it is, of course, then by that stage, um, the principal royal centre of 
Munster, perhaps, perhaps even Ireland. Um, a major part of its ceremonial architecture is this monument called Duff Coach, which is a sunken routeway that approaches the Rock Cashel from, from the northeast. Um, and the sunken routeway seems to be a characteristic of major royal sites where we get a site that kings processed along. And the idea that being sunken was that um, the body of the king was to synergize and, and kind of um, be in union with the place of kingship that was his seat of kingship. So by literally descending into the ground of the royal landscape, the person became that royal landscape and became the institution of kingship that they're, they're connected with. But the Duff is interesting because this monument allows us to trace the procession of, of Cash's kings for about three kilometers through the, through the landscape, which is unheard of anywhere in, in early medieval Europe to have that length of procession and detailed in, in archaeology. Um, it's a really interesting monument because it has a whole series of turns and twists in it that suggest um, specific areas were highlighted um, kind of symmetrically for, for being singled out as important spaces. Um, so you can see in, in, in the geophysics on the top right, where we have the extension that's marked here on the bottom, from the right hand side of that image, is actually an extension of the avenue. And in the interior is, is a barrel that we can see just up on the top left. And that barrel um, is, is incorporated within into that avenue um, to kind of highlight its position. Um, in, a, in, in the, the architecture of that avenue, it seems to be a kind of symmetrical way of, of, of drawing your attention to the significance of this monument. So this could be a royal burial, this could be a place of one of the area kings of Cashel where they were buried and then incorporated into processions. We know then that um, king, the ceremony of kingship or inauguration ended up on, on the rock, but there's other places within the landscape that would perhaps have been important. One is the Loch de Finnet, just to the southwest base of the rock. Um, Loch de Finna suggests a lake or a body of water, and excavations there have shown um, perhaps a mound for a, a lovely 6th century Canandular boat, you can see on, on the screen, was discovered um, in the, the 90s. <coughs> and Loch de Finna it derives from Loch de Fina, um, and Fina is the same, it's the same derivative as, as Latin vagina, <coughs> so it kind of connotes the same pattern of kingship that we get elsewhere, which is connected with kind of sexual union of a king and the land and the sovereignty that is associated. Um, I mentioned about that pattern pattern to the main street of Cashel. So this might be the course that the, that the procession took to return to the north corner where we had that, that um, rock cut gorge and avenue that I highlighted at the, the start. Um, we also get in place then is this element of Fatcha or Green, which is an area outside of a high status dwelling that seems to suggest um, the place where ceremonies were enacted um, in Cashel's place. Um, the final stage of the inauguration of the King of Cashel was, was um, when he was taking a place called um, Ron and Eerie. And this is almost certainly Ballon Ree Fort to the south of, of southwest of Cashel, the Rock of Cashel, which derives from Ballon Ree and the place of the King, um, which is another one of these forts that seems to originate as a defensive fort, but then becomes a ceremonial monument in the, in the 8th or 9th century when um, a blessing was pronounced there. And, um, King was basically proclaimed to the, to the people. Um, so this seems to be another little, little micro-complex that's involved in, in the ceremony of an order in the King of Cashel, but it seems to have been maintained and the prerogative of the kings of Aga and Muscariga, that it's a piece of land that is maintained by those kings and um, further superior to the, the, the kings of the kings of Cashel. So even within Cashel itself, though we usually think of you know the, the rock itself, the area around it is a whole host of royal one, it's a whole host of places associated with kings, it shows the complexity of some of these, these royal landscapes when you look in, in detail at them. Um, why that's important is because we can start to see in the politics associated with Cashel's kings how they use subject peoples and, and, and other minor peoples um, to create kingdoms and, and create the province of Munster and then to actually, to actually govern it towards the end of the medieval periods so between the 8th and the 11th century. I mentioned the way the 7th and 8th century saw the royal estate and have a settlement pattern which harmonised with the, the extent of the estate. In the 9th and 10th centuries, we actually see that change when we get platform ring forts or, or mounded ring forts, which, which seem to be later than normal ring forts and normal farmsteads. Um, but these are concentrated in the east and north of the royal estate, perhaps suggest the distribution of people, isolated people that maintained and, and kind of defended the royal estate and cash from threats emanating from the north, where of course the Inail, who was the kings and Tara, would, would kind of fit that bill to a certain degree. Um, immediately outside the royal domain is another kind of 
the last royal seat where we have Rack McCarthy. Rack McCarthy East and West are two townlands on the outside of the royal state. Um, but they seem to be the capital of um, a kingdom called the Muscariga. So the Muscariga are people who are very archaic in terms of their names. On that side, I had to start with Riga names. They're the oldest, most archaic form of, of people names. Um, and the Muscariga are a really good example of that. So they control the five kingdoms, which you see on the top right, and spread throughout Monster. But they don't appear to have owned any of these lands before the 8th or 9th centuries. They seem to actually be people who were relatively minor in significance from somewhere in southern Tipperary. And then in the 8th and 9th centuries, they had a whole host of lands gifted to them by the kings of Canada. And this seems to be reflected in that ceremony of inauguration because it was the king of the Muscogee who proclaimed the king of Cashel to the people at the end of his, his inauguration ceremony. And, and that, that role, that, that close relationship between the kings of Cashel and the Muscogee is embodied in the placement of their, their principal royal estate, Rath McCarthy, um, immediately adjacent to the royal domain of the kings of Cashel, which you can see there on the, on the, on the side on the, on the left. So Rath McCarthy is in the kingdom of Muscogee or Fleming, but it's a state which is essentially Kilbra Parish, and adjoining the royal estate to symbolise that, that union of the Muscogee and, and the kings of the kings of Cashel. Um, then in the myth which describes the founding of Cashel, the kings of Aelia are associated with the maintenance of, of Cashel and, and its kingdom, and it's the, the swineherds or the Herbers of the pigs of the kings of Asia who, who do this. And, and it seems that their, their seat, the Idirdru, um, was Loch Mok, just to the, the southwest of Ballon Ree, um, which suggests a place in, immediately to the, the, in the vicinity of Ballon Ree, which is the culmination of, of inauguration ceremony. This was a place, another royal seat of the kingdom of Asia and the peoples of Asia, as we mentioned at the, at the start. Why this seems to be significant is because all these changes that were seen in the rise of new prominent peoples in the 8th and 9th centuries and then being given new royal sites in the vicinity of Cashel um, seems to be connected to a change in the nature of Cashel itself. So I mentioned how in the inauguration ceremonies we get evidence for the union of the king with place and that element of vagina in Loch uh, Lefina outside Cashel suggests some, some pagan element. And, and that would be content of what we know from other royal landscapes and royal ceremonies elsewhere in Ireland. Um, but why it seems to be suggested here is because the 8th and 9th centuries see a big change in, in Munster, and um, as Cashel becomes the centre of the kingship of Munster. But its kings start to look farther afield, and if they have these pagan elements in their ceremonies, they can't really, can't really do that on the national scene. So what they do is they start to emphasise their, their Christian nature, their Christian piety. So in the 9th century, Cashel becomes the first royal seat from anywhere in Ireland to build a church at the heart of the, the royal landscape. And this has been excavated by, by Brian Hodgkinson. You can see the footprint of the church in the, um, the bottom left, where those, these are post holes in the, in, in, within the Forest Chapel, which show this 9th century church. And this is the base of a high cross that was found on, on the rock as well, which is probably 9th century in date. Um, and you can see the, the, the footprint of that, that church and in over the outline of Cormac's Chapel, the present-day Cormac's Chapel, within the summit of the rock itself. It's quite a small structure, but since, um, I suppose intellectually it's quite important and quite a, an audacious structure to a certain degree. Um, it seems to actually be mentioned in the text which um, refers to the inauguration ceremony of the Kings of Cashel. It gives us the, the kind of way that the inauguration ceremony pans out. So it's intimately connected with that ceremony itself. Um, why it's significant is because not only is it the, the, the only known church from any royal site in Ireland, and it's a significant departure from ceremonies, from, from the idea of kingship in Ireland previously. Because the person who built it was a guy called Fadim Ema Priven, and he's the first king of Cashel to probably have held ecclesiastical office while he was a, a king. Um, so he's both a cleric and a king, so he's obviously going to emphasize the Christian nature of his, his kingship. But he's also um, very possibly the person who patronised the Durin of Flan Chalice, which of course the brewery is so famous for. Because Durin of Flan is actually the seat where it failed to held ecclesiastical office before he became King of Cashel. And Durin of Flan itself is in the adjacent townland, this patch of, <coughs> of um, parish, which you can see highlighted on the screen, which is St. John, John Baptist Parish. This is the attached portion of the royal domain of the Kings of Cashel. So it's a royal estate of the Kings of Cashel, adjoined to Durin of Flan, 
shown again another important royal landscape and royal seat that we've forgotten, but which provides a really good context for understanding the Darien of Lamb Chalice, again, 9th century in date, probably at the same date as the building of that church on the rock itself. And so that's why, in around this period, Cashel becomes an exceptionally Christian kingship in the sense that it's articulated as a Christian seat of kingship. And why it seems to be doing that is because what its kings are trying to do is change it from being a um, kind of middle of the road orders place of kingship to being the place of kingship in early medieval Ireland. So from the 9th century, people like Fabian challenged for authority on a national scale. And Fabian is probably the first king um, of anywhere in Ireland to, to, to get close to claiming an actual authority that extended throughout Ireland. And um, one of the ideological pillars that he did this on um, was being making Cashel the, the Christian antithesis of a pagan Tara. We're all familiar with the myths to do with Tara and being cursed by St. Patrick and, and whatever. And for the most part, these seem to originate in, in this period. And um, Fedorine was also a Cayley Day, and one of his colleagues, Angus, um, composed this martyrology, which laments the pagan nature of all the other major royal sites of, of early medieval Ireland. So in this period when this church has been built and during the final chalice is, is being, being, being constructed with you know, fine art, artists and, and whatever, Cashel is becoming a seat of national kingship and you know, the prime contender for a place of national authority. The church in that respect is really, really integral because the 9th century sees the construction of royal chapels and a whole host of different, different major royal sites around Europe. So the Portivia Arch is one where the kings of Scotland or the kings of Pickland, basically in northern Britain, um, constructed a, a royal church in the 9th century. This is the only remnant we have of it here, this arch on the bottom left of the screen. And this is Santa Maria del Narango and um, in Aviedo, which is the seat of the kings of, of Leon. And they built this, this royal chapel, which is so close to being a royal hall and a royal residence that we're not entirely sure whether it was a chapel or a, a hall or a royal residence. The model for all of these sites seems to be Charlemagne's chapel at Aachen, which was completed in, in the early 9th century and went on to be, to be mimicked elsewhere. So I would suggest that in constructing a church on the top of the rock castle in the 9th century to be a seat of the kingship of Ireland, Fatimi was alluding to the types of royal authority and kingship that are proliferating around Europe and most, most kind of famously in Charlemagne's chapel at Aachen and the types of kingship and Christian monarchy and that are being, being advanced there in that respect. Things change again then because even though Fader made the case for Cashel to be and to be the centre of the kingship of, of Ireland, and um, he wasn't so successful, of course. Uh, Brian Baru and um, his descendants took over the kingship of Cashel and, um, and Munster in, in later centuries. Um, but as they centralised power around Munster, many of these royal seats that we've been referring to started to, to fade and fall out of, out of use. And what we tend to see happen is that the royal dynasties that control these seats and control these kingdoms start to take ecclesiastical offices and they move into, into, into churches around the, 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 the kingdom. And then the Dáil Cash, who is Brian Baru's dynasty, patronise these churches and they, they create reliquaries like this one here, um, which was possibly, possibly actually patronised by Brian himself. It has an inscription which says, Mock Kennedy, the re era, Brian son of Kennedy, um, King of Ireland. So that's Brian Baru being titled King of Ireland. And, but Brian also seems to have rebuilt that church that was constructed on the Rock of Cashel by Fadeline in the 9th century. And I would suggest he did that because when he became King of Ireland, he saw himself as a King of Ireland not because he was a King of Tara, but because he was a King of, king of Cashel, a King of a Christian seat of kingship that reflects all this, this patronage of Christian seats. Another way that these, this whole host of royal seats in Tipperary starts to change and fall out of use is in the way that the Kingdom of, of Munster was, was created. Um, so this is a 9th century text that's written around the same time as that church was built in Cashel. Um, but what it does is it claims for a king of Cashel the right to install vassal kings in their, their local kingdom. So it, it claims an authority over the royal seats that were a symbol of kingship for all these local kingdoms and these kind of parish-based kingdoms right around Tipperary and Munster more generally. By claiming that authority, it implies that kings of Cashel actually controlled those, those seats. And I think we can actually see these, these changes in the landscape of these, of these, these localised royal seats. And I'll just use one very selfish example um, before I finish up, which happens to be my, my hometown. And um, one of the reasons I ended up studying kings and kingship was because I'm from Nina, which originates from the Irish Antena, the market or the assembly place. 
um, but it was the assembly place of, of East Munster. Um, the only archaeological evidence we have for that assembly place is this royal cemetery of, um, of the local kingdom, which is excavated at over Ardick. Um, and it seems to have been integral to that assembly landscape from an early period. We have the Nantmere approach, which is probably 6th century in date, very similar to the one from, from Cashel, um, and an oil which you can see on just above the Penanian approach there. And um, so that, their evidence for 5th to 8th century activity, high status activity in the area around Nina, but then these fall out of use in the 8th century, and when they fall out of use, activity shifts to this place called Tullahidi. And the original name for um, Nina is Enakur Lohan, but before it was called the Enakur assembly place of East Munster, it was called Enak Teda. And Tullahidi um, derives from Tullah. Teda or Tullock Teda, and um, basically the, the hill, the mound of Teda. So Teda was this mythical ancestress um, that was a, an ancestor for all these kingdoms, the localized kingdoms that would have used Nina as an assembly place. So as the cemeteries connected with this landscape fall out of use, activity shifts to Tullahidi, to this Neolithic mound at the center of, of assembly. So I would suggest that this is the Tullock Teda or the mound of Teda, the place name implies. But it's also the centerpiece of this, this assembly landscape of Nina. Um, at the point at which East Munster gets, gets mentioned as a district within texts. So I think what we're seeing is actually the creation of new myths for origins for these people scattered around Munster and how they relate to each other. The kind of origin myths that tie together the genealogies and ancestries of all these people. Um, and we're seeing this being, being incorporated into the landscape by emphasizing new monuments that break with the past and then create new myths for that past. What's significant about Nina is that when it became an assembly for East Munster, not only does that apply, apply again, the kings of Cashel control the local royal seats, that explains why they fall out of use, it also implies a level of jurisdictional control and, and the origins of a system of governance that we would kind of connect with later kingdoms in terms of kind of state level politics that we see elsewhere in Europe in the 10th and 11th centuries. So this is a really significant landscape and, mo and monument to show how kingship was developing in, in Ireland, um, albeit in northern Tipperary as opposed to, to southern Tipperary. So that leads me in a kind of um, flight of fancy to a little bit of, of you know, optimistic news um, for a project that um, we've just got funded, which is going to address all these issues, but try and place Tipperary and, and Cashel and some of its royal seats on a, on a European stage. So we just heard last week that we've been given um, a million pounds by the Leverhulme Trust to study these royal landscapes, and particularly Cashel as a part of a project looking at northern Britain um, and southern Sweden um, and Ireland and Munster um, by the Leverhulme Trust in collaboration with colleagues in Uppsala in Sweden and in Aberdeen in, in Scotland. It's quite a significant coup, but it's one that's going to allow us really to paint a new narrative of the nature of kingship and its, its European importance kind of address some of the more kind of France and Germany centred models for how we understand kingship in a European context. So we just announced this during the week through kind of a, a news, you know, news release or whatever, but the best thing about it is that we get to spend a bit of um, money putting Ireland and Munster on a European stage with this project, and, but it's funded by the British government. <laughs> so with that, I'm